Evening. It's it's a great um, pleasure and honor to be here with Sima Samar and um, oh no. <laughs> Amida Aman. Sorry, sorry, Amida. And um, I'd like to thank the festival and all the partners that are um, supporting this evening to make this possible. And I'd like, of course, to thank the two of you to come. Um, so far to participate in this debate. I will switch from French to English, I think, because um, Hamida speaks French, of course, very well. And um, uh, Sima can follow it on the, on the uh, microphone. And um, also we can have questions later in French and in the English. So the objective of this panel really, for us, it's very important to um, change our perception of Afghanistan a bit to enlarge our, our view of Afghanistan. A lot of people um, today see Afghanistan as a country at war, with suffering, with poverty, with corruption, with all sorts of problems, and don't often miss out on the other dimensions that Afghanistan has to offer, and especially Afghan women have to offer, that are a, a, con a creative, courageous, inventive, progressive contribution, not only to the Afghan society, but even beyond Afghanistan. And today we would like to make, um, um, to focus on these dimensions as well as on the problems that we still know are present in Afghanistan. The second objective of the panel is also to see that what can we do um, here in, in Switzerland or in this area, uh, far away from Afghanistan sometime, what can we do to support the efforts and the aspirations of, especially of Afghan women, but really Afghan women and men who want to work together. So um, I'll start by introducing Sima Samar, um, a really extremely active um, career. Um, you were born in Ghazi, Afghanistan. Um, for those who don't know, uh, in Ghazi there's a population called the Hazara, Hazara is a population in Afghanistan that has been largely persecuted um, for, for, for many years, for, many, for a long time. So in a way, um, you accumulate almost two minorities, right? The Hazara and the women of Afghanistan. Um, Sima studied medicine in Kabul and practiced medicine in Afghanistan for a few years and then had to flee to Pakistan when um, under the Russian occupation, her husband was arrested. You stayed in Pakistan, I think, 17 years. Um, in Pakistan, she set up an NGO already, started working uh, on health for women and, and girls in particular, and then returned to Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban and was uh, deputy chairman um, at the presidency and also the first minister of women's affairs in Afghanistan. Um, Sima has been uh, nominated to the Nobel Peace Prize. She's achieved a lot, many, uh, many more things than what I've just said. Today, you're the chairperson of the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission, but you've also, or, or, uh, also served as a special um, a rapporteur for Sudan, I believe, yes. These are just, in a few words, uh, some of the amazing achievements of Sima Samar. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you is really, with such a rich life, with uh, all that you've seen and been through, what is your highest mission? What is the mission of your life? What's your highest aspiration? Is it? Yeah. Yes. Um, good evening, everybody. And uh, Happy Women's Day to all, um, to all women around the world, but, but particularly the, to the one who are men and women who are sitting in uh, tonight. And thanks for coming and your interest to Afghanistan and Afghan women. Um, <coughs> uh, I think um, I decided long ago to, to fight for equality and for justice in Afghanistan. Uh, I would say that we achieved a lot in the, um, it's 40 years that I'm, I'm in this struggle. Yeah, I, I personally would say that I achieved a lot in my life, but uh, 
I think we still have a very, very long way to go. Um, as you said that we, um, I was running, I began this NGO uh, in 89 when I was working in Pakistan as a refugee, living in a, in a refugee condition when you don't have identity is really difficult. I think we, in Afghanistan, we had the, the biggest number of refugees in the longest also after Palestinian. Um, uh, but to live in that condition, and I was working as a, as a doctor in a hospital, uh, one day when I came to, to that hospital, it was a Christian hospital in Quetta, which was built during the, uh, the British in India. In 85, it was the 100th anniversary of that hospital, so it was uh, quite a established institution, but they had a department for refugee for men and women. And that was the only hospital, in fact, had a department for women, because um, a lot of, uh, most of the um, political parties in a, um, who was working for, for the Afghans were uh, involved on, on jihad, I would say, or uh, freedom um, fighters against the Russian occupation or invasion in Afghanistan. Most of them had the hospital, but it was for their male member of the party. It was not for their family, so they didn't have female doctors and female staff and so on. One day when I came to the hospital, there was a young Afghan woman. She was pregnant for the first, for her first child. She had eclampsia and she had convulsion. So I was running here and there to find somebody to give me some injection in order to stop her convulsion as, at least. The pharmacy was closed, the delivery room was closed. So I used to come early and leave the hospital later because it was my own people and I was feeling or acting very revolutionary, I would say. Then I uh, referred this patient to another hospital to um, a local Pakistani governmental hospital, but unfortunately she died. And then I decided to establish a hospital. So I, was, I went to the same group of people who were supporting this section of the uh, hospital, and I said, can I have some money for establishing a hospital for women and children? And he said, uh, no, because um, we cannot afford it, and it was, uh, we will be under attack by the fundamentalist. The reason I'm mentioning this is this. Um, unfortunately, during the war, usually women are forgotten, and women become uh, a tool in order to use it uh, as a war, uh, a weaker tool, I would say, a vulnerable group to sexual abuse um, as a, um, to defeat the, the people. So uh, Afghan women was really forgotten. And it was all the, the men who was fighting against the Russian and they were getting every benefit. And the gun, unfortunately, we continue to get gun. We don't know exactly where we go with all the guns and we don't know the exact number of the guns. Anyway, but then I started school because I was thinking that uh, education is key to, to change the mentality and to change the society. And one of the issues that we really still suffer is lack of education within the community. Um, currently, we have nine million children, at least eight to nine million children going to school. But unfortunately, the quality of education is not still very, very low. Uh, so, I began those things and I um, established, built a lot of hospitals and school in the country, uh, did a lot of livelihood program for women in Afghanistan, faced a lot of problem, of course, in Pakistan and also in Afghanistan, but I didn't give up because I wanted to show that as a woman, we can, we can also work. And then I was lobbying for women's equality and women's rights in Afghanistan and also in Pakistan. Then uh, during the 9-11, of course, we had different regime and every regime which came to power in Afghanistan, they were not really pushing or supporting at least women's equality. They were not recognizing women, I would say. 
Um, then we had the 9-11, unfortunately, and the, the different countries, the Western countries are involved in Afghanistan, and they came and they removed the Taliban from the position of power. They were not removed, I mean, they, they're still existing, unfortunately. But then I think, uh, because I was lobbying for women inclusion, they put me in that position for six months. I was the uh, cha deputy chair of the uh, President Karzai on that time. And then I was also the first minister of women's affairs. Again, in the Ministry of Women's Affairs, because it was new. I mean, it was not a lot of political will to support, the, to establish the ministry by our own government. It was really a side event, I would say. But I was able to establish the Ministry of Women's Affairs, and then uh, there was a lot of criticism against me because I call for equality. I call, more importantly, for accountability and justice in Afghanistan. So we have a lot of people who do not like justice, and the culture of impunity, unfortunately, continues not in Afghanistan, but all, all over, almost, in the world. But then I was put as a chairperson of Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. So I'm almost 13 years that I'm chairperson of Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. But I would say that we, I established a lot in, in Afghanistan, in a country where using the word human rights was, was uh, counting as a crime. Now we are doing a lot of work on human rights. We were able to push for women's equality. We really fought hard in order to include the word woman in the constitution in Afghanistan. So at least in the constitution we have, for first time, we have equal rights for men and women. Of course, it has to become a reality in the ground, but uh, that we need to work hard in order to make that uh, a reality and possible in Afghanistan. Um, for the first time in Afghanistan, we, the um, criminal or violence against women is criminalized and we have a law. Of course, this law has a lot of obstacles. Uh, we have a lot of uh, few members of the parliament who really stand against it and claim that it is not according to Islamic law or uh, uh, Sharia. But uh, uh, there is an improvement. At least we changed the, um, the environment and the um, human rights, the word human rights, turned to be discourse within the families. Uh, this is a big achievement in, in our region, uh, actually, I would say, because in Afghanistan, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of um, access to different places. We look at the prisons, we look at the women's rights, we look at the children's rights, we look, with the, uh, look at the people uh, with disability, and we are uh, also monitoring and investigating the human rights viola violation in the country. We did a lot of work on transitional justice, although we still have a long way to, to bring justice in the country and stop the culture of impunity, but we did all these work. Yeah. And, but my dream would be that women in Afghanistan would be treated equally with dignity. And that's a long way, I think. I need to still continue the fight. Okay. Yes. And we will do it in time. <laughs> we'll come back more to um, your work and your achievements and also the situation in Afghanistan. But let me introduce Mrs. Hamida Aman. Um, Madame Aman, um, a Mrs. Aman was born in um, Afghanistan after a, quite a long trip through different countries, took refuge in Switzerland. So you went to school in Switzerland. Uh, you have studied in Lausanne in uh, social science and journalism, uh, uh, philology, yeah. And uh, you started a, a, a career of journalist, uh, and you have been uh, working for the Swiss journal Libdo. And uh, uh, you know Switzerland well. And then you get, went back to Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban regime in, in 2002, and you remained in Afghanistan, and you have created your own uh, uh, company of protection. Of a production, ah, a film production company. 
I was about seven or eight years when we took refuge in Switzerland. Uh, and 20 years after, I went back to Afghanistan as soon there was an opportunity. And uh, after 9-11, uh, I was able, unfortunately, was this was the reason which allowed me to return to Afghanistan. Uh, having been 20 years, spent 20 years in Switzerland, I was very well integrated. I was very lucky to study here, to have access to everything to, to, which a normal child can uh, hope for. But I, I kept very preciously all my memories of childhood, and my parents always were always talking about my country and uh, encouraged me to make choices in my studies and in my career, things or activities or topics which could be uh, useful later to my country. My father and my mother always said, what you learn here will be useful one, once, uh, inshallah, in Afghanistan. Maybe we can return to, to, in this country, not only not to live in the country, but at least for holidays. So I, was, uh, I didn't see this moment uh, come. And after September 11, we all understood that uh, everything would change. So I went back to Afghanistan at first uh, to meet my family and my grandfather, whom I loved uh, very much. And uh, once there, I quickly understood that the life would be different for me. You have to, to just to, to imagine how Kabul was after the Taliban's. I arrived in October 2001 in this, con in this uh, town. There were no, not human being. There were quite dead, dead people walking around. I mean, they had come out this period of a very many difficulties and harsh period and one wouldn't know what was going to happen and I realized that I have to stay here I have to do something uh, just to be present and to see what is happening maybe uh, bring a small contribution to uh, to what is being done so I uh, started with media proje projects with uh, NGOs first a French NGO then an Afghan NGOs around media projects and these experiences has uh, allowed me to meet young people, men, women, very brave people with a will to do things, very similar to the young girl we've seen in this film. And there were a lot of them. And that time, in 2002, the life was horribly difficult, no electricity, nearly no food, no nothing would work, the roads couldn't be used, and uh, the people started to awake. So why did I stay? It was like a call, a call of, uh, of my country telling me, you have to stay, you have to do something to contribute to something. It is uh, remarkable that y you actually chose uh, uh, media and you created the uh, production group. So uh, how, how are you organized? Uh, what does your company do? What have you been able to accomplish uh, thanks to this uh, production company? So I created a company very quickly. I realize that you know if we if we want to establish ourselves in a sustainable way, uh, and uh, you know the future of the country uh, uh, will not happen without economic development and the private sector, and uh, so by uh, setting up a, a production company because that's what I knew ab about, and uh, with uh, the help of uh, 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 technicians. People had more te techno te technical companies, so we created in 2004 Awaz, which means, you know, the way my cousin who's here, Karim, who uh, who's a cameraman, a cameraman and a sound engineer, I called I called him for help, and I said, Karim, I'm going to open a small, set up a small company. I have a little bit of money. Come and help me. And uh, he said, yes. Uh, immediately other people joined me who, were, who had the qualifications that were needed. And together we set up a small team of young people who were highly motivated and who wanted to learn 
and who could speak English, who knew a little bit about you know IT, and more than that, were highly motivated at the time. There were there was yeah you know, there was no uh, uh, technical schools or a school of journalism to uh, train uh, uh, people. So you know we uh, started uh, uh, working on uh, uh, t training uh, programs. So we became one of the first uh, production companies, production and, uh, communication. So what we do is to uh, create uh, content for the local radios and local television channels and to uh, work on communication campaigns uh, for, for, for uh, national uh, coverage for, uh, to actually raise awareness about uh, politics, uh, uh, civil rights, and to explain you know, what's at stake, uh, uh, the democracy, and what it means, the democratic process. And, uh, and uh, so after... Uh, 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 several uh, uh, widespread uh, communication campaigns. We started working on uh, television series, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, soaps and uh, uh, entertainment programs, but uh, that uh, also have an educational edge to them. Uh, so, you know, through these uh, television series, we uh, uh, put messages across. So in 2010, we uh, produced one of the first uh, uh, police uh, uh, series, and then we went on with the series serials for the youngers, and that uh, dealt with all the issues, problems uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, the 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 young are uh, confronted with. And uh, yeah. So what is interesting about uh, creating a company which uh, today works very well? You you had the opportunity to train people who had uh, no. Uh, opportunity to train themselves in the area of medias and no place where they could learn that. All the companies uh, in, in Afghanistan, microfinancing banks, we have to, we had to start by, by training the people we hire. So now you have schools, you have uh, schools which are a bit more developed, you have uh, training centers, uh, the young people are more qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, in ours, in my production company, the average age was 25, and we had uh, young young men, young women working together in different uh, um, different professions of the camera, editing, video editing, script writing, uh, journalism. And uh, besides our production company, I have also a radio station, which is a radio for young people, which is uh, directed by young women. It's only a woman team at the beginning. We s s thought that it would be good to have only feminine voices uh, to attract as much uh, listener as possible. And those women are somehow the cement of this radio are holding the, uh, the radio together. Uh, now the teams are mixed, uh, men and women, and, uh, and uh, I try to give those women a place, a working place where they feel sure, secure, and when you are young, it was diffi it is difficult to find work in Afghanistan, and to do it in a safe way, and to have a good, to keeping to have a good, having a good reputation, because the pressure is very strong uh, from the families. Any woman working in a, any profession, and here we are talking about media, which is a profession which is quite exposed. So the young uh, women are criticized, like uh, the young girl in the film, the two young girls in the film. So you have constantly critic criticism uh, against these girls that the families are put under pressure because to so that they would f ban their children from work. Some are. Achieved when you see the film about these girls boxing. How how have we progressed in Afghanistan since the fall of the Taliban? What were the achievements for women's rights in particular for women's role in society? Well, as, as I said, that we really achieved a lot in terms of uh, 13 years ago or 14 years ago. Um, there were no girls' school in Kabul, for example, or in the big cities, which was controlled by Taliban. 
and now you see everywhere girls even in boxing or they run, they do boxing, they do every uh, non-traditional sports and non-traditional activities in Afghanistan, including running companies because we didn't have a um, companies before run by women. And now we have few women, I mean, not a lot of them, but they are women, business women in the country. In fact, today, I think the French embassy and German embassy uh, given an award in Kabul. I, I, I missed it because I was here. Uh, to a businesswoman, I think we choose a lady from Herat who was doing a business on saffron. Because saffron, uh, we try to replace with opium. So she does uh, produce saffron and made her own company and try to find uh, uh, companies who buy their saffron. I think she already has some customer from Dubai and trying to find people uh, from China, a customer. I was joking, I said if and every Chinese use one, one small leaf of saffron, then we will sell a lot to, to China. So you're trying to, to also sell to India because they are also very highly populated. So I would maybe ask the people in Switzerland to use the Afghan saffron in order to reduce opium in the country. So there is, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, activities. But I would say that it is, unfortunately, it's only in the big cities. In the rural areas, uh, in most of the remote parts, or most mainly on the districts, which is under control of Taliban, uh, and they are affected by war, it's not a lot of uh, improvement on uh, women's condition. Uh, but as I said that, unfortunately, um, it's everywhere that we, I don't know in this country, but in most of the countries, we still, uh, women are not equal. Uh, even in terms of um, equal salaries. But we had in Afghanistan equal salaries for years and years. A yeah, female doctor and a male doctor is earning the same amount. A female teacher and male teachers is getting the same salaries. But um, in some of the Western countries, they are still fighting for equal, sal uh, equal wage or equal salaries. Um, so generally, in our, in our region, unfortunately, the, uh, the extremism or the, let's say, the new fundamentalism that raised in began, unfortunately, mainly, I mean, they, they were before, but it's, they were not as extreme as they are today. And most of them are trained in Afghanistan during the jihad. So I think from the experience in Afghanistan, the international community and all of us as human beings, we have to learn and not repeat the mistakes that we all have done in Afghanistan because we choose the most conservative, the most backwarded, the most, most aggressive people in order to fight against something, mm -hmm. which was the Russian in our case. And most of these people who are involved on, on terrorist activities has been trained somehow, or has been in Afghanistan. And luckily, there are not a lot of Afghans. I mean, at least the terrorist activities around in, in Europe or a few months in, in France. So it was not Afghans, but they were most probably trained in Afghanistan. So we have to learn uh, from our past mistakes and should not, we should not repeat it. So I think we still have very, very long way to go. And, and what role do you see that women and women's organizations are given today in Afghanistan to participate in this peace process and the reconstruction? Well, on the peace process, I would say not much because you know that we, the previous president, President Karzai tried to, um, uh, he was calling upset brothers, not really even Taliban when it was some action by them killing the civilians, and he was sorry, he was saying it's, it's the foreigners, it's the neighboring countries, but he was calling them upset brothers. He was not even willing to say Taliban. But um, I, I think 
then he decided to have a peace talk with them. There was some talk going on, not only by Afghans only, but the different countries were competing in order to find someone who looks like Taliban most of the time, not really a real Taliban, or uh, a person with authority on Taliban uh, movement. Uh, then he had this consultative peace jirga, and uh, somehow, I think even the, the final declaration before the, uh, the jirga was finished was already written, and that was announced, and uh, he established the High Peace Council. In the High Peace Council, he has 60 men and um, only nine women because we really fought that women should be included. And one of those women got asylum, unfortunately. So now we have eight women in the, in the High Peace Council. But usually when they go for serious talk, first of all, they are not taking women with them. Secondly, if they do take some women, and then they, they had a trip in, in Turkey, and then uh, they were not involved in the serious, let's say, talk. They would usually say, go and see Istanbul or Ankara or do some shopping, rather than sitting on the table in, uh, to negotiate. So now it's the same, unfortunately. It's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of this talks about talking with Taliban, and I, I don't see it that it, it will happen soon. But is there, do you sense that there is a trade-off? Est-ce que vous avez l'impression qu'on a fait des concessions en essayant euh, en extreme groups and women's rights there's a fear that if there is more space given to women the peace can't be achieved with the more extreme elements well i think even if they uh, sign a document with the the taliban and the extremists and they come to the country that will not be peace so I think if we just uh, think that we should have not uh, terrorist activities today or not hearing the, the noise of gun or uh, any explosion, that will not be peace. So I, what they try actually, they try to find somehow or try to pressurize Pakistan to push the Taliban to come and sit on the table. So far we will not allow them to do that. So I think the young generation in the country and women who are quite active in the country, we fought in the last 40 years with very difficult situation and condition. We will not allow them to do that again. So they might do, and they might wish to, but I think we are st strong enough to stop them. Mm -hmm. We will not allow them to, right. to negotiate in our rights, and the, generally in the principles of human rights. I mean, we are fighting for, um, for accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, it might take a long time, but I don't see it very quick. I mean, um, whatever they promise to the people is not going to happen soon, so. in my view. <laughs> True that Afghanistan is a very young country, as uh, Sima said, there's a lot of uh, young people. Uh, it's also true that you know uh, you know this is very active uh, there's a lot of energy and uh, it's b bubbling so how are you able to uh, uh, c c convince the young people uh, to take responsibility uh, within uh, society and uh, to engage and to be active citizens so uh, the, the youth that uh, makes up more than 60, 60 percent of the Afghan population, as in many uh, developing countries, by the way. Um, so this youth, you know, is hungry for knowledge. Uh, for instance, practically all of the uh, young people working uh, at uh, my office get up at five in the morning, and for most of them, you know, they actually take courses, whether you know, in English, or marketing, or business, uh, you know, a law. Uh, you know, they, they take, uh, uh, you know, evening classes are very popular. I mean, they have a private universities, a private uh, uh, schools, you know, that are mushrooming about. And uh, so uh, they, they want to make the most and to uh, catch up with lost time. Uh, so as, uh, you know, we saw the, the young girls boxing, they want to, you know, be uh, uh, 
uh, part of the world in Afghanistan. Uh, they were very much, you know, uh, they were kept silent for too long. They were in the shadow. And uh, if they want to actually seize this opportunity, and again, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this window they can finally see light through. And uh, so over the last few years, uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, training programs uh, set up, uh, you know, for uh, media training. And uh, there was, you know, training programs for journalists, uh, you know, uh, uh, technical level uh, and uh, drafting classes, uh, audiovisual uh, and uh, also training for, for women, young girls. And uh, generally speaking, you know, the young uh, seize the opportunities uh, uh, when uh, they're there. They want to be active, and they know full well that, that it's uh, through education and work that they will uh, achieve something. And, uh, you know, in most of the homes, it's the young uh, people, you know, who actually uh, uh, bring money to the household. The young uh, people, you know, uh, you know, are, find, are finding it easier to get jobs, such as in uh, international organizations, in the uh, non-governmental organization. When I say young people, I mean, you know, those between 20 and 30 and uh, beyond, of course. But this uh, age uh, category are very active. And, uh, and the young uh, women, uh, they uh, and uh, the, and uh, they they have been uh, massively hired in NGO and also in the private sector, and uh, so obviously uh, there's been a, a, a financial resource for families, and they brought in you know uh, actually uh, quite a significant uh, income to their uh, uh, households. So even the most conservatives were okay with their uh, uh, daughters going to work because there was an opportunity and there was a financial need. Uh, since by allowing their daughters to work, uh, that meant uh, money was coming back to the household. So, Sima Samar. And in what Hamida says, um, there is an opening. Um, there is more willingness to let girls go to school, maybe even engage in a professional life. But then, like we saw in the film, all of a sudden, they hit a wall. They hit a wall, and they're blocked, and they're kept away from something that could maybe be more public, that could be something that exposes them uh, more publicly. What is it? Is it culture? Is it religion? Is there a place in, in, in Islam for women to play a leading role in society? Or is, is that a limited space? Well, I think it's power. It's not religion. It's not really um, culture, I would say. It's power, how to control, how to dominate. So the power can be used anywhere and everywhere. And they can use different tools in order to control, to have domination on, on people, and particularly on women. It's easier to control them. I, I think there's no problem uh, in Islam. It depends how they um, translate, how they, they interpret it, and how they use religion. It's not only in Islam. Look at the other uh, religion. Uh, I'm sorry to to mention this example, but look at Catholic that do not allow uh, to use condom, and the people in Africa, women in Africa, and and children, men in Africa, dying every day from from AIDS. So uh, I think it's the question how to control. So there's a there's a, um, unfortunately, misuse of religion by always, most of the time, men. It's not, I'm not against men, but it's the, in reality, they are the one who controls, they are the one who interpreted the, the religion, the majority. I mean, even in, in Christianity or in Hinduism or, or in Jews, how many female religious scholars we have compared to the male religious scholars. So it's always the question of control and, and uh, politics. It's a, a question of power relations Absolutely. between men and women. So what roles can men play to actually promote the women's rights and uh, a stronger role of women in society in Afghanistan? Well, I think uh, men in every country and women is, I mean, they are half of the population, they can play a strong role. And I think respect for women's rights is respect for human dignity. So men has to realize and has to recognize that they, without women, the humanity will not continue. The, the easiest example. 
And if we do not respect the dignity of women, we do not respect the dignity of human being in ourselves. Because at the end of the day, who they are? They are born of women. So they have to realize and recognize. And that, of course, requires a, lot, a long time everywhere to, be, to make the people to recognize, to acknowledge that, yes, women is equal to men. And without them, it's, it's not possible to continue the human race or human, humanity, I would say. Mm -hmm. So it is um, through education, through a lot of other policies and, and rules uh, and regulation, we can make that happen. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the countries, there are uh, a lot of good achievement. And uh, you know, in a, in a so uh, so in a concrete way uh, in the field, you know, how how do you deal with uh, uh, the uh, differences, you know, between men and women, men and women, in the different projects uh, you lead? So you know, uh, the, 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 so so uh, men and women. Uh, work, you know, uh, at my office together, uh, and uh, and uh, you know, at the beginning uh, they were kept separate. When I set up the the radio team, the the girls were in their little corner. They didn't want to participate. Uh, they kind of kept to themselves, and you know, they were very embarrassed. But uh, you know, there comes a time where you have to say to them, you know, if you, if you, your colleagues, your work colleagues, and you need to learn from one another, you need to communicate. Uh, and the girls have a tendency of, you know, uh, you know, uh, keeping a low profile, uh, and uh, that's not what we uh, want from media people. That's not what expected of them. We want them to communicate, to try and uh, learn from one another, and um, and uh, so at the same time to try and encourage them to work together. Uh, so you have to also be very careful. Uh, careful about you know people's customs and uh, their culture. Uh, I mean, again, you know, again, uh, uh, we're not used to promiscuity between men and women or to work uh, very close to one another. Uh, we're not used to that. And you know, again, there's such segregation in uh, Afghan society that uh, you know we don't feel comfortable. And uh, uh, so obviously. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, you have to deal with all of these uh, uh, matters and uh, different uh, uh, sensitivities. You have to be careful about the reputation of the people also who work, uh, the, the women who work in the company uh, outside. And uh, for example, we, um, when, uh, uh, when a young girl is recruited, I always try to meet with her parents, and I, I, I see the parents at the office. They come to the office, and I try and uh, you know reassure them. I say to them, you know, this uh, your daughter will work in this type of environment, and will be careful. And we try and maintain a good reputation, and we have a good reputation uh, um, in Kabul and in Kabul. So, a as employer, yes. Uh, and um, uh, we're uh, trying to uh, uh, make pa the parents feel comfortable so that they will actually trust us and uh, uh, will uh, uh, trust us with uh, their uh, uh, daughters and, uh, and to convince them that we will give them a harmonious work environment. I think we can open the discussion to the audience and uh, receive a question in French or in English. I think you have microphones. Who would like to ask the first question? There is a lady here. It's a question for Amida. You have said that uh, you have been uh, producing a lot of contents for radio and and uh, for national radio and t t television. Do I would like to know? Do you manage to bring uh, contents which uh, are important to you? Or uh, is there a control or a censorship, kind of a censorship uh, concerning the contents? Uh, and it must be sh broadcasted on local radio. How, how does it work? Uh, the the, the uh, content uh, uh, we uh, 
produce are uh, connected to a type of communication because you know we, we are not just uh, a production company uh, or we're not just a tra traditional production company uh, but uh, we work uh, with uh, the government and we uh, examine the, the topics on which uh, its communication is needed and uh, we um, we produce uh, you know, again, you know, the uh, crime series, the police investigation series, which is to actually uh, uh, to encourage people to become policemen, to go into the police force, and it's uh, to actually uh, uh, re kind of uh, reinstate the tarnished reputation of the police corps. And uh, all the media uh, do uh, censorship. We know the, the limits of society and what uh, people can listen or cannot bear to listen to. So what I'd like to also say is that, you know, we're lucky to have in Afghanistan media that are very uh, free. Uh, if we compare uh, with uh, the neighboring countries, Afghanistan is, uh, has one of the uh, uh, media laws that's the most uh, flexible, and we are authorized to criticize the government, but, you know, perhaps not criticize or point a finger at certain individuals, but uh, there is uh, a certain uh, the protection, uh, so the, 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 the media are, are pretty free. And uh, 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 so, as regards our content, well, of course, we know that uh, we, don't, we, you know, we don't criticize religion, and we uh, are aware of the values and people's mentalities, and uh, our programs are adapted to our uh, audience. Yeah, any other questions? This lady in the front. Thank you very much, Marie von Axbernon, member of the par uh, council, head council. Mrs. Amar, I had the honor to meet you with Shekeba Hashemi in Kabul in 2002. I have uh, many respect for you. I would like to know, in your role as a, pr a chair of the Independent Afghan Commission on Human Rights, what is your role with the Afghan women in parliament? One of our um, mandate is to promote and protect women's rights. So we really try to, first of all, to make change the law and reform the law according to the human rights values and principles, and uh, try to make the laws friendly to women. And then we protect generally women if there's they are in, in danger. Um, we do have different programs. We do. Uh, we did some uh, national inquiries and research on on different topics, which is uh, effect has re is related to women's rights and have an impact on on women's rights. So we did recently. We did a um, a national inquiry on honor killing and rape. Where the people, I mean, we have honor killing in Afghanistan. Nobody was talking about it, and it brought a lot of a lot of uh, information and awareness among the public. And we were able to put really to criminalize this honor killing, because according to the Afghanistan, let's say, culture and also the laws, when no one comes and complains, that then nobody really they hear about the crime. But they are not going to uh, to find out and catch the criminal. So it is now uh, some uh, different approach. So they are not able to kill a girl and go without without accountability. Because, for example, in Afghanistan, if a girl is raped, then the family was killing her in order to keep the honor of the family. This is not the case now. Now the family is coming and complaining if a rape happened. We had a cases, several cases when in a very conservative remote part of the country, a nomad girl was raped and they came, the father came with the, his daughter in Kabul and said, as many television as you want me, I would go and speak publicly, show my face and show my daughter's face in order to protect the other girls in the country. So it is a lot of, uh, um, we are involved in everything. 
when it comes to women's, including uh, women's participation in the government. We are really fighting hard in order to have more women in the government. The recent unity government promised four women in the cabinet. When it came to the real introduction, they introduced three women in the parliament, to the parliament with the, the rest of the cabinet. And then, of course, almost all three of them were not accepted. One, they, they said that she has dual citizenship. She had a Turkish, I think, and also an Afghan citizenship, and she was removed from the list. The other one was younger than 35. According to our constitution, a, a minister should have at least 35 years of, of uh, age. And the third one, they said she did not complete her uh, bachelor degree. So it was kind of, a, we fought, and I publicly said in the television, I said, I'm so sorry, it does show the lack of commitment of our leadership, the two doctors that we have. Because among the five, at least five million women, if not 10 million, there might be five women who's capable to be a minister, or qualified to be a minister. So we're really fighting for everything. Then what was happened, I make, made a long list of, not very long, but 23, 24 women, uh, and sent a letter to both of them, and said that uh, they are qualified to either to be minister or to be the governor, to be m ambassador, to be deputy ministers. So I collected all the CVs and I sent to them and hopefully they will introduce four women at least as they promised. So, uh, but saying all these, I have to say that we really have a long way to go. Uh, I just came, arrived yesterday, so I'm just saying my experience. When I was looking at how many people I flew with Emirates, which is, they have very big planes, I don't know how many people they, uh, they have in the plane, but when you look, the number of women who are traveling is really low. It shows the actual condition of women in the world, not only in Afghanistan. Because who has the money? Men has the money and they travel. So it's very few women. That is our condition. So we all have long way. But our way, our, our road is longer than the others. <laughs> and more difficult. Any other question? Uh, questions? Yeah, monsieur. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. So uh, a question, question to both of you that comes to mind. Um, you know, for your activities in Af Afghanistan, the people who work along your side, what would you say of the uh, Western intervention in Afghanistan for so many years? Was it a positive thing uh, for uh, liberties and freedom? So how, how, how do you, uh, you know, what's your take on what's been happening since 2000 in Afghanistan in terms of Western intervention? I think we had no choice. We were not in a position to um, get rid of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan itself. Um, and of course, the Western countries, and I would say US, was forced somehow to, to come to Afghanistan after the 9-11. Otherwise, they were for, forgotten about us. We remember still when the American wanted to recognize the Taliban government because of the pipeline. So it was... That was our reality uh, in Afghanistan. So when they came, of course, we, uh, with all of them, I mean, we had more than 65 or, um, countries in international uh, institutions like IMF, World Bank, Asian Bank, and I don't know which bank, Islamic Bank, who came to Afghanistan in order to um, develop the country and promote democracy. But I would say that they came without long-term strategy because we could have done much, much better work if we were coordinated, if we had a long-term strategy, not gone for quick fix programs. So it, of course it's good, but I would say that um, it would have been much, much better to work better in Afghanistan and produce a good model of democracy 
then they rushed and gone to Iraq, unfortunately, and now we see what is going on in our region. Partially, it was the mistake of our supporters, I would say. So I'd like to add, so if you ask uh, people around you in Kabul or anywhere else, you know, nobody you know, regrets the time of the... Uh, so, you know, we were, uh, you know, so at all levels, whether uh, in the field of education, uh, health, uh, the infrastructures, everything had been destroyed. So uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, over uh, 40, for 40 years, Afghanistan uh, endured all possible regimes. Uh, so uh, again, there was a, a monarchy, uh, and we had a monarchy that uh, turned into a popular republic, uh, but uh, you know, but it was more of a dictatorship, and then uh, you know, we had uh, socialism, communism, socialism, and uh, there were w many years of uh, civil war, and we ended up with a uh, totally backward, backward uh, regime, a theocracy, and uh, so uh, there was nothing much left, and especially the the uh, years of uh, civil war and the Taliban period uh, uh, finished the destruction of jobs, so we're starting from zero. So, you know, 15 years have gone by, there have been, you know, millions have been spent, and as uh, Mrs. Sama was saying, and uh, and uh, they were always, uh, the money wasn't always spent in the best way, everybody had their own agenda, but what we can say is that uh, uh, people's lives has changed in reality. Yes, their lives have changed. Uh, so whether it be you know, at the uh, level of the economy, we have roads now. I mean, to go to the north uh, in Mazari Sharif, uh, it took more than 12, took between 12 and 14 hours, and less than six hours you can get to Mazar, and the same for the south. And you know, the, uh, the ma major uh, roads are uh, working. I mean, maybe you don't have uh, a security, but one can, uh, uh, people can uh, move from uh, town to town. Uh, for, you know, transport of goods is possible as well uh, uh, through the road network, which is, of course, a very good thing for trading. And uh, you can actually, uh, there's more contact uh, between regions, and you're actually uh, pulling them out of their isolation thanks to the network. But it's true things are slow it's true that a lot of money has been spent and uh, that's for sure and uh, there is a certain amount of frustration amongst uh, the uh, people but the progress has been made definitely so the one more question yes uh, at the back of the room and then I think we will have to close this debate yes sir, thank you very much uh, uh, madam for your testimonial, and uh, I find what you said uh, rather encouraging, but on the other hand, when, when you hear in the film that they're talking about a law uh, providing for uh, stoning for adultery, I mean, you know, that uh, gives me the impression uh, that, uh, you know, it looks like, you know, they, oh, they want to go backwards. And I wanted to know what was your vision of the uh, uh, near future now that uh, you know the international uh, troops have uh, withdrawn or are in the process of doing so. Well, I I don't think the stoning will be the law. We will not allow them. It it never been the law. Uh, it was only under Taliban, and unfortunately, in Mujahideen group, they they still does in some part of the country which is not under control of the government. So we will not let the stoning to be the law in the country, uh, even if it, if it we in the um, sacrifice of ourselves. So we assure you that. The second thing, what I would like to tell you that in 2013, everybody was on not sure that 2014 will be really difficult here for Afghanistan. We had the political transition and we had the security transition from the um, NATO troops to Afghan security forces. But all happened. It was first time in our history that the transition of power happened without aggression, without killing. Um, so that has happened. The transition of power from the NATO troops to Afghan troops happened. The security is not deteriorated very much. It was already under, uh, when the NATO troops were there. 
So uh, what I would say is that I don't think we will go back. There's no space for Taliban to come back and restrict our, our space. Afghanistan today is not Afghanistan which was in 2000, in 1990s. So Afghanistan is different, but saying all these, we still have problems in our reform of the law, we still have problem on, on implementation of the law, we still have problem in our reform of the judiciary system in the country, we still have a lot of, uh, a lot of um, economical difficulties because with the withdrawal of the troops, we a lot of people lost their life, uh, a lot of money withdrawal from Afghanistan also with the withdrawal of the troops. But I would say that we will survive all these with caution because our region is not in a very uh, good condition uh, um, politically. Unfortunately, you see what's going on around us. Uh, so bear with us and keep supporting us. Don't let us be alone again. So let me add on to this maybe with one last question just to close this debate. What can we do? What can we do to support Afghanistan and the women in Afghanistan and women's organizations in Afghanistan? Well, one, I think, please keep solidarity with us and support us politically. Two, I think, um, do support whatever you can in for empowerment of women on education, particularly as a tool to empowerment, or as a key to empowerment, I keep saying, or as a key to democracy. Uh, and finally, I would say that keep raising awareness among the other people about Afghanistan, that Afghanistan is not only Taliban. Afghanistan is not only suicide attack. We are victims of proxy war. And if we don't have uh, security, if we don't have rights in Afghanistan, you will somehow suffer. We are part of the human body. So bear with us, stay with us, and keep supporting us in any way you can. And thank you very much. Thank Let's you. stop here. Thank you. Maybe the same question. Just, just uh, Hamid, I have to ask you the same question. What, what can we do? So uh, I'd like to add something else. We have to uh, continue maintaining links with Afghanistan even after the withdrawal of the foreign troops. And you have to come and invest in Afghanistan. And there are resources. Uh, and um, it is true that... Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, we've come a long way, but uh, I think we, uh, we're, we're not uh, doing too badly uh, right now. You know, contrary to other countries, uh, we haven't uh, uh, fallen uh, into uh, a uh, war between the Sunnis and Shias, as is the case in Iraq. We, uh, uh, again, you know, there's no uh, civil war in Afghanistan as uh, we thought there might be. So I think that, uh, you know, we're going to still, um, uh, you know, we're going to have to still, uh, as we say, c cross the desert. But uh, inshallah, uh, it's going to take a long time, but it will happen. And uh, we simply have to uh, uh, continue. And uh, again, Afghanistan should not be forgotten, that's for sure. And, um, and as uh, uh, Mrs. Samar said, you know, put uh, political pressure so that, uh, you know, the, the, the few things we've gained over the last few years uh, are not lost. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank the festival. For ha I'd like to thank the festival for having uh, highlighted Afghanistan. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Samar, and also uh, you, uh, Mrs. Aman, and thank you all for being here this evening.